welcome to Gwinnett County Public Library's Meet the Author series. We're very pleased this evening to have with us the author of this book, Judy Battalion, The Light of Days, The Untold Story of Women Resistance Fighters in Hitler's Ghetto. She is coming to us from New York City and our, our moderator today is also a, a well-known uh, Georgian, I was gonna say Gwinnetian, sorry. <laughs> She lived in Gwinnett, but she doesn't. Um, she is Dr. Catherine Lewis. Dr. Catherine Lewis is the Assistant Vice President of Museums, Archives, and Rare Books. She's also the Director of the Museum of History and Holocaust Education and a Professor of History at Kennesaw State University. She is the author, co-editor, and co-author of 15 books and has curated more than 40 exhibits for organizations around the nation, including the Atlanta History Center, the Bremen Museum, Delta Airlines, Augusta National Golf Club, and the United Way. And she is doing an enormous favor tonight to be here with Gwinnett County Public Library. I give you Dr. Catherine Lewis. Oh, thank you so much, Denise. And it's lovely to have everyone. I know Judy and I wish that we were all in a room together uh, to have this conversation about this amazing book, but we're gonna have to do the best we can uh, with the technology available. Um, so I'm gonna talk for just a moment about the book and then introduce Judy, and then we're just gonna dive right in uh, to the conversation about the light of days. Uh, so of course, one of the most important stories of World War II, uh, this book has already been optioned by Steven Spielberg for a major motion picture. It is a spectacular and searing history that brings to light the extraordinary accomplishments of these brave Jewish women who become resistance fighters. And they witness uh, the brutal murder of their families and neighbors and the violent destruction of their communities. But this cadre of Jewish women in Poland, some of them who are still teenagers, helped transform Jewish youth groups into resistance cells to fight the Nazis. They do extraordinary things, these ghetto girls, as they come to be known. They pay off Gestapo guards, they hide revolvers and loaves of bread and jars of marmalade, and they build systems of underground bunkers. They flirt with German soldiers, bribe them with wine and home cooking and use their Aryan looks to seduce them. Uh, and in some cases would shoot and kill them. They bomb German train lines, blow up water supplies, and yet they also nurse the sick and teach children. These exploits of these women are virtually unknown. Um, and Judy has really done an extraordinary job of bringing their story to light. Now, those of you who are interested in history and know something about the Holocaust will know that this is reads almost like a thriller. If you're a fan of Hidden Figures or In Garden of the Beasts or Band of Brothers, you can put Light of Days in that category. It really is an extraordinary story of incredible women whose little known feats in some ways changed the, the face of the war. Uh, so you'll see it's already a bestseller in USA Today, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, Publishers Weekly, and I predict it's going to be a bestseller just about everywhere. Judy's exhausted because she is doing this book tour. Um, and I want to introduce you to her. She was born and raised in Montreal and grew up speaking English, French, Yiddish, and Hebrew. Studied the history of science at Harvard, moved to London to pursue a PhD in art history. And you'll get a sense of Judy's rich history when you understand that she's been a curator, a researcher, an editor, a comic, an MC, a script reader, a dramaturg, a performer, actor, producer, translator, and even a temp worker. Um, she has transformed all of these experiences uh, into uh, written material. And you could see her essays in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Vogue, uh, the Forward Salon, and the Jerusalem Post. Um, she has another book, of course, that preceded this one called White Walls, a memoir about motherhood, daughterhood, and the mess in between. Um, and that is currently being developed into a TV series called Cluttered. Uh, but back in 2007, Judy was doing research on strong Jewish women at the British Library. And any of you who've been there know that's an extraordinary place. And she came across a dusty old Yiddish book um, called Women in the Ghettos. 
a Yiddish thriller about these ghetto girls um, who become these resistance fighters. And that is really the nugget in the beginning um, of the, this book. Light of Days, as I said, has been optioned uh, by Spielberg and Judy lives with her husband and three children in New York City. It is truly my pleasure to introduce her to our Atlanta audience and our Gwinnett audience. And uh, Judy, we're just so glad to have you here. It's beautiful and sunny in Atlanta. I don't know how it is in New York City, but we hope you're enjoying some good weather. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. I wish I was in Atlanta. It's about 35 degrees here today. Um, so many reasons why I wish this was in person. Um, right. <laughs> thank you so much for that incredibly kind and mostly true introduction. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to be taking you on tour with me everywhere. I hope you're right. available for many Zooms. That was absolutely very kind. <laughs> Anytime. So Judy, I think let's dive right in and talk about the impetus for the book, right? You talk about it sort of by accident being in London 14 years ago. Can you share that story with us? Sure. So this book began completely by accident. Um, I, I'm not a Holocaust scholar and I hadn't intended to write this book at all. I, um, I was living in London. It was in 2007. And I, I was at the time thinking a lot about my Jewish identity. I am the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. Um, but I was thinking mostly about what I call the emotional legacy of the Holocaust, the way that trauma passes through generations. And in my own life, I was, I was very interested in how I felt that my Holocaust heritage was shaping how I perceived and reacted to danger. Mm. Um, and that was something I wanted to explore. And I was doing a lot of performance work at the time. So I decided to write a performance piece about confronting danger. And I wanted to have a strong Jewish woman, a real person, a historical figure at the center of this piece. Mm. And the first person to come to mind was someone named Hannah Senesh, oh, yeah. um, who I studied in fifth grade. But oh, for, wow. those, for those of you who don't know Hannah Senesh, yeah. she was a young Hungarian Jew um, who in the, in the 30s, before the war, she moved to what was then Palestine. But during World War II, she decided she wanted to fight back. She joined the Allied forces. She became a paratrooper and she volunteered to return to Nazi occupied Europe. She mm -hmm. chose to go fight the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And I'd always, as I said, I studied her from a very young age and I'd always sort of imagined her or I'd always learned about her. She was always a symbol, a hero, a symbol of courage. But back in 2007, I wanted to understand not Hannah Senesh, the symbol. I wanted to really understand the person, the psychology. Who does that? Who volunteers to go fight the Nazis? What kind of personality does one have to, to, to be so audacious, to be so bold? Um, so what I was looking for was a nuanced biography of Hannah Senesh, not just a sort of hero narrative of mm -hmm. her, but someone that had really written intelligently and, and insightfully about her psychology. That's what led me to the British Library, mm -hmm. um, where I looked up Hannah Senesh in the catalog. There were not very many books about her in the British Library, so I just kind of ordered whatever they had. And one of the books that I picked up in my stack, I noticed was unusual. It was an old book. It was a dusty with a blue fabric cover and um, gold lettering, and, and it was in Yiddish. It was called Freuen in the Ghettos, Women in the Ghettos. Um, even more unusual than the book is that I speak Yiddish. So I, I started flipping through this book, looking really for Hannah Senesh. That's what I was after, but I couldn't find her. She was only in the last 10, 15 pages. In front of her was 150 pages with pictures and photographs and bios and names of dozens of other young Jewish women who fought the Nazis from the Polish ghettos with chapter titles like weapons and ammunition and partisan combat. And, and as I said, there were photographs of all these young women. And I just, I was stunned. This was, this was not something I had ever heard, both in, in content and even in tone. Mm -hmm. 
it was so different from any Holocaust narrative that I had grown up with. Um, and, and, and then I knew this was something I had to pursue. Um, and, and that's how it all began. It's a fascinating story. And as a historian, you just never know uh, what you're going to come across, right? Um, well, and you, for those of you who've read the book, you know that, uh, that Judy does such a nice job um, of evoking the world before the Holocaust. And I think certainly something very important, um, you know, what is the, what is the Jewish world uh, before the Holocaust uh, for women in Poland? Yeah, one of my favorite elements of this research, obviously I was so surprised by everything I learned about, mm -hmm. about these women in the war, but one of my favorite parts was learning about Poland in the 1930s, Poland mm -hmm. before the war. It was such an interesting and exciting and difficult period, but it's been so eclipsed by what came after mm -hmm. um, that, that people, I didn't know much about it. So now I already forget your question. About uh, the yeah. world that well, the world that Polish well, Jewish women lived in before the war. So this was a world of ambivalence. On the one hand, this was a great uh, was a great cultural moment for Polish Jews. Theater and literature and it, universities and in professorships and political parties. It, Warsaw in the 1930s had 180 Jewish newspapers. I mean, it was really a cultural. Yeah. Uh, um, golden era. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, there was anti-Semitism, both institutional and social. There was a growing sense of a purebred nationalism, which did not include Jews and other minorities in Poland. And, and so the Jewish communities both were flourishing. They'd lived in Poland for a thousand years, over a thousand years. It was 10% of the population. Um, but also were struggling with feeling like second class citizens. Um, so that was that was kind of the overall, that's my overall on Poland in the 30s. But what really amazed me was how I think using current terms, how progressive it was for women. Mm -hmm. um, women were, education was mandatory for boys and girls up to eighth grade. Women were allowed to go to university. Women, the majority of women in universities in Poland were Jewish. Many times I came across stories of a uh, woman in the resistance, it, you know, she would shoot Gestapo men in the head and she had a history degree from Warsaw University. <laughs> wow. were very educated. Mm -hmm. um, women had the vote in 1918, which is before right. many Western countries. Mm -hmm. um, Jewish women worked. In 1931, you had about 45% of the Jewish labor force was women. Women, oh. they got married later in their late 20s, early 30s. They had fewer children. They worked more. They were engaged in the public realm. Um, and in it, it, all this, even their fashion, even, and I talk about this in the book too, was, you know, women in the 30s in Poland, they wore sh fitted blazers and short hairdos with clips and sh shorter skirts and low heels. They could walk, they could run. Um, it was, it was a, a, a time that was, I mean, it's very interesting to me. Yeah. Well, and I think you make a really good point that you're right, that so much is focused on Poland 1939, right, September 1st with the invasion, um, that, that that sort of interwar period is is sort of lost uh, in some ways, uh, but it's as interesting as Berlin, right? Think about Weimar, right? And think about New York City. And it's, it's a lot of the same trends and you had, I mean, another interesting element of that time, especially in the Jewish community, people were multilingual. They oh, right. spoke Hebrew, Yiddish, Polish, then it, depending on where they live, Russian, German, German. French. Mm -hmm. um, and they, that's why this 180 newspapers was in various languages and people flip back and forth between these languages all the time. It was such an unusual mm. moment culturally, linguistically for literature, you yeah. know. Well, that'll be your next book, Judy. But let's talk <laughs> about this one. <laughs> I know. I'm totally very interested in the Absolutely. 1930s in Poland. Absolutely. We do such a nice job of evoking that pre-war period. So you sense that these women are, are not simply victims uh, of, uh, of Nazi Germany, right? Of course, they have rich and complex lives before and after. 
uh, the war. I think we certainly get a sense about that. And one of the themes uh, that emerges, of course, through your book is that gender dramatically shapes their experiences, right? Resistance fighters, um, you know, men and women have, I wouldn't say completely different experiences, but gender is certainly a moderating factor. Um, So talk a little bit about what you learned uh, as you were doing that and how gender both gave women opportunity and limited uh, them, right? It can be simultaneous. Yes, there was both sides, but right. let me let me start with this, and then I'll forget, and you can remind me to come All back right, to the we'll other side. <laughs> so, women the the women played certain roles in the resistance and in the underground in in this time. Jewish women, and they took on many of the roles that were done outside the ghetto. Um, mm-hmm. Jews were ghettoized in Poland. They were imprisoned in these tiny difficult, starving neighborhoods. Um, And Jews were not allowed to leave. If you were caught on the outside, you would be killed. But Jewish women often pretended to be Christian. They performed, they passed is the term that we use Mm -hmm. um, as being non-Jewish, as being Christian Polish women. And it was, and so they could end up doing resistance work outside the ghettos, which included, let me, I was gonna say, I'll come back to it. Let me just tell you now. So they did a lot of work outside the ghettos, like in particular, um, I talk about this role of courier girls, Mm -hmm. or in Hebrew, it's uh, keshariot, connectors. Mm -hmm. And these were Jewish women who slipped in and out of the ghettos, connecting the ghetto, there were 400, over 400 ghettos in Poland, they served as as they they brought information to the ghetto. The ghettos had no radios, they weren't allowed. Newspapers weren't allowed. So it was often young Jewish women who were passing as Christian who would go between the ghettos and provide information, even information about the war, information about the Nazis' genocidal plan. They also brought supplies. They, they had underground presses. They brought underground bulletins. They brought books um, as the militias, as the underground developed into more of a militia, it was often young Jewish women who were arming them. They were the ones leaving the ghettos, going to meet with weapons dealers, going to meet with um, the Polish resistance, Mm -hmm. buying guns, ammunition, taping it to their torsos, bringing it back into the ghetto. Mm -hmm. And they also did a lot of rescue work outside the ghetto, helping other Jews find hiding places, taking care of them in the hiding places, paying off their hiders. Um, And so all this work had to be done, as they say, on the outside. And the reason Jewish women were doing this was because it was easier for them to pass. And the reason was easier from pass or few reasons. Mm-hmm. So one of them is that they were not circumcised. Right. Jewish men were circumcised. Jewish men had a physical marker of their Jewishness on their body. So if, if, if they were outside the ghetto and someone suspected them of being Jewish, they, at gunpoint, they'd be told to drop their pants. Women did not have that threat. Moreover, in the, as I was saying, in the 1930s, my new obsession, Jewish women were educated, they went to school. But in many Jewish families, they chose to send their sons to Jewish school. And in order to save on tuition, they sent their daughters to Polish public school. Right. But this ended up being a great advantage to them because the girls who then went on to become these resistance operatives, they learned, they were around Christians, they were around Catholics all day. They had Catholic friends, they learned their they're, they knew prayers. They right. were aware of custom. They were mm-hmm. aware of mannerism. I'm seeing myself on the Zoom now, like talking like this. That was a thing. Gesticulating was Jewish. So one woman writes about how she had to wear a muff mm-hmm. while she was trying to pass to stop her hands because that that would look. Glasses were Jewish. Um, it even had to do with how many times a week you brushed your teeth. Jews brush their teeth a certain way. Non-Jews brush their teeth a different way. Like the, the nuance right. in daily habit and mannerism, Jewish women were aware of that because they, they, they were around that. They were educated. And, and most important, they talk about this all the time. They learned to speak Polish like a Pole, not right. with a creaky Yiddish accent. So Jewish women were, were much more able to blend in. In fact, if a man, if a Jewish man from, from the underground ever had to leave the ghetto, he almost always traveled with a woman 
partially to make it look like they were a couple, but right. partially because she did all the talking. If they had to buy a train ticket, she bought the train ticket. If they had to get an apartment, she negotiated for the apartment because the woman tended to speak a, a more convincing Polish. Um, and then on top of that, of course, women were also, you know, as women trained to be, to follow others' cues, to think about what others are, mm -hmm. are considering, to be aware of others, to be coy, to be flirtatious. These were all, these were all skills that were very useful for going undercover, for, for being spies, especially in, you know, Nazi culture was so classically sexist. Women just weren't suspected of, uh, you know, why would that girl carrying a teddy bear also have a gun inside the teddy bear? That was not... That was, that was so far from the expectation. And so for all these reasons, mm -hmm. uh, women were better able to do a lot of this resistance work, especially that on the outside. Well, and that's, that's a terrific answer and, and also a very nuanced, I think, uh, conversation about the, the, the women's ability to pass in Polish society I think for the whole, all the reasons you spoke about, they go to the, they went to Polish schools. Uh, you're right. If they knew the Catholic prayers and they, they knew the songs and there was just a kind of ease in Polish society where, where the men uh, would have had a sort of different experience. It, it also the expectation that women would be resistance fighters, uh, right? That, that most people simply didn't expect that in a carriage, you know, or a uh, pram uh, that ha was supposed to have a baby would have guns, right? Uh, that women were kind of invisible uh, in society. And that's, that's consistent with resistance fighters in and outside of Poland, right? So I think you really get that, uh, that sense of that. Well, and you talk about, and I think you really touch on a theme that also rides through the book, which is that women were not footnotes to the resistance. They were really the nerve center of the resistance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I think this goes back to their role as these connectors. I mean, it was women who were going between the different ghettos, the different units of the underground. They were not just bringing information, they were, you know, they were bringing, they were giving lectures. They were, they would have meetings, you know, they'd bring all the Jews secretly, the young Jews into, into a basement. And it was the woman that was getting up there and, and, and inspiring confidence and, and later, you know, inspiring them to fight. And it was women coming in with, with these, with the information. And, and they were, I would say they were like the internet of the time. Right. Um, right. They, they, no one had information and they, they, they were, they were that, they were the, the nerves. Well, and you have a number of characters that you meet in here, and I can certainly see the appeal of possibly making it into a film because there certainly are uh, well-rounded characters, but Rania certainly is one of your main characters, right? She seems like a very unlikely resistor. Uh, right, uh, that she didn't think of herself as political and a lot of the women didn't necessarily, right? Um, she wasn't part of a particular organization and yet there she is, uh, a, a woman who becomes quite an extraordinary resistor. So talk a little bit about how what we might think of as kind of ordinary women um, become involved, what motivates them um, and how do they get kind of pulled into the resistance? So in Rania's case, yeah, she wasn't very political before right. the war and or after the war. And I think that's why I was drawn to her. She felt very relatable to me. A lot of the her, her writings in her memoirs and her testimonies were they weren't a lot of the others wrote in a very political language. So mm -hmm. even though they were talking about their experience, a lot of it was about, you know, socialism and and they, they had this kind of platform to share or that's how they express themselves. And she just didn't, she right. just wrote her narrative. And it, it was very, it was detailed. It was even witty. It, it, she, she very much felt like there was a person behind her writing, a, a unique individual. And, and I immediately felt a connection to her. Um, because of that. And I, I, she was someone who, you know, she was, she went to school, she um, became a student, she studied to be a stenographer, she was 15, she started working in the town court. Um, and then it was 1939. Mm -hmm. And 
she, but she was, you know, defiant in the ghetto f- from the start. She would sneak out uh, to, to trade, you know, family heirlooms for, for food for her family. She tried to help other Jews coming to the ghetto and, and tried to help her brother who was taken to slave mm-hmm. labor. She, um, and, and then when she found out that the, that when she realized her and her family that they were going to be killed, she fled, she escaped by herself. Mm -hmm. Um, and she, she went through, you know, time by herself in Poland, wandering through forests, pretending of course, to be Christian. She had a, she looked good. They used to call it. Right. She was lighter skin, lighter hair. It was easier for her to pass. Um, and, uh, she, she actually got a job working as a housekeeper for a German family, but she wanted to be with her sister, her older sister. And she managed to find a way to connect with her. There was a functioning postal service among all Mm -hmm. this. And she connected with her sister and her sister arranged for her to be smuggled to the town of Bijin, where she was based. Mm -hmm. And her sister was part of the underground and part of the resistance. And when Renya met her sister there, she found out immediately that her parents had been killed. And this, and I read this time and time again in testimonies and in memoirs, this moment of becoming an orphan, Mm -hmm. she was 18. It really changed people. And and, and I'm taking this from their accounts. They they felt very suddenly unhinged. Their their worlds, they they were like, you know, the world that existed, the structures of normal life were now gone. Mm -hmm. And and I, I read different people writing on this, some of them felt that it was, you know, they needed to throw themselves into resistance work, partially to numb their grief and their pain. And that that kind of intense energy and purpose was actually, you know, propelled them to survive and to live. And, and, and also Renya felt fury. I mean, fury. This, This was so unjust this how could this be how could her parents have been killed the the, there was a lot of passion in and you know it wasn't political in that it was socialist but it was political in that this is unfair and this must be corrected and Mm -hmm. this was a you know a fury and and for justice and, and for freedom and and i think that's what motivated her so they basically the underground needed someone who looked good to go to Warsaw for them because all the other couriers had been killed, mm-hmm. and and they ask her and she says of course I'll go, um, and, and I think it's this, this the, the passion and the fury that that really motivated her and the need for that purpose and the need for that yeah that 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 righteous righteous uh activity in some way to kind of you're right to write things to to feel that you're contributing to, yes in, in a powerful way well and you also make a really interesting point about a lot of the jewish resistors as they pose as polish and those who get captured um become tortured as poles not as jews uh and that's a very different experience can you talk a little bit about that yeah so I, I don't want to give too much away, right. <laughs> but but some of the characters, not saying who, do get caught eventually right. on their missions, but they're performing so well that, that it's never realized that they're Jewish. The Nazis Jewish. don't realize that they're Jewish. They think right. that they're Polish. Oh. They, they, they're usually found with a gun or with some fake ID or something. So they know they're part of an underground, but they think these women are part of the Polish underground. Right. And so they are, they are imprisoned. They're not sent to concentration camps or immediately executed as a Jew would be, but mm-hmm. instead they're imprisoned in political prisons right. and brutally tortured because the Gestapo is trying to get information from them about the Polish resistance and the Polish underground. And in some of these stories, one of the women that this happens to ends up going through Auschwitz, I mean, for years, mm-hmm. I, the whole time they always as a as a pole as a pole she, she never she she does not break character you know for an instant um 
And that is extraordinary because you were treated very differently for a whole host of reasons in the camps, right? For political prisoners, uh, the Roma, Jews, Poles, right? So in some ways their, their experience is quite unique um, and likely contributed to their survival, uh, though brutal um, as, uh, as it was. Um, so I want to invite everyone, um, and we're so glad you're here and have a chance to talk to Judy. Um, we're going to uh, do um, about 10 or 15 minutes more questions and then open it to the audience. So please uh, feel free to pose some questions in the chat while we're continuing our conversation. Um, and with that, Judy, you sort of talk about kind of hard and soft resistance, right? Uh, that armed resistance, uh, of course, there's plenty of that in here, but also um, what we think of as kind of soft resistance, uh, caring for orphans, creating libraries, saving documents. There all, there's a range of resistance activities and women seem to play a role in all of them. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the sort of categories of resistance? Yeah, you know, when I first started, when I first started working this, I tried to make categories. I was like, right. there's six categories or eight categories. Or right. I don't know that there are categories, but there's a span of activity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some people would say that, you know, the Nazis wanted all the Jews dead. So just staying alive was resistance. Right. Um, any, you know, hiding is resistance. Escaping is resistance. Um, there are a lot of cultural, you know, a lot of these women, especially, I mean, the Warsaw Ghetto had tremendous cultural activity. There were arts competitions and, and a street called Broadway because it had so mm -hmm. many theaters and mm -hmm. they were putting on plays and shows and many women were involved in that kind of, um, yeah, cultural, spiritual nurturing, um, soup kitchens, underground schools, secret schools. They, they ran all kinds of secret schools. They called them the flying gymnasium um, because each class would be a secret in someone's apartment. They didn't have a building and they would, you know, the few children with that teacher would go to one person's apartment in a room crowded with other Jews and they would host classes. And even they did exams, they did end of year exams and they really maintained a curriculum um, in this way. Um, so that they, they, as you said, they did a lot, they, there was a lot of stories of secret libraries, books were outlawed, books were burned, Jewish books. Um, so many stories of books being smuggled, books being kept, books being mm -hmm. stored. There's one of my favorite stories. Um, I know we're here through a library this evening. So I will talk about one of my favorite stories is about how the women in Warsaw, they're not allowed to have a library. And so they what they do is they go into a whole bunch of Jewish homes and cat in the ghetto and catalog whatever books people had brought with them mm -hmm. and create a catalog so that they can then present. If someone wants to borrow a book, you can see what address it's in or if someone wants to yeah. access a book. So they kind of make their own cat. So these are also forms of resistance and resilience and defiance. Mm -hmm. um, even telling jokes. I actually, in an, my earlier drafts, I had much longer sections on humor, but I, my editor made me cuff them. But, you know, even humor um, is a form of resistance. Oh, is a absolutely. form of, you know, spiritual, creating camaraderie and and upping morale and, and a sense of release and, and even control over yourself, over your environment. Um, so all, the, all these forms I, I've tried to bring out in the book in, in different ways. Absolutely. And I think you really get uh, sort of a clear sense of that. And one of the, I think, extraordinary things, and for those of you who haven't read the book, you'll now have to because you, uh, your interest has been peaked in all of the range of activities that the women do. But you also make a, a really powerful point that not everybody survives surviving. Uh, right, that that the there are plenty of Holocaust survivors who survive the war, survive the camp, survive hiding, and an extraordinary range of experiences, and yet um, come to the end of the war or in the post-war period are not able to survive that. Um, so, talk a little bit about that kind of post-war um, experience of the trauma, right? The inherited trauma. Um, of, of the war and how it shaped that post-war period. 
Um, so first of all, I, I should just explain that the, the book is in four parts and the mm -hmm. last part is entirely after the war. Right. And um, obviously for those who survived, I tried to follow their lives after mm -hmm. the war to speak to their children, their grandchildren. I wanted to, this whole project, as I said, began with my interest in the generational transmission of trauma. And so I wanted to come back to that. And I, I mean, I'm so interested in not just how they how they fled or survived, but how they went on surviving. Um, and one woman said, she said, you know, after the war, we were, we were free from the fear of death, but we weren't free from the fear of life. And mm -hmm. these women had to learn how to, I mean, they had to recreate their entire worlds. Um, and, you know, the, I'm writing about women who are very young, I should say, during the, these women in the resistance that I write about were all around age 20. When right. the war was over, they were, you know, 22, 24. Um, they had nothing. They had no family. They had no home. They had no nationality. They were refugees in new countries, and they completely had to start over. And I write about different people, so it's hard to generalize. Right. But some of them managed it, and some of them did not. And certain... Um, some of them really were very tormented by either survivor's guilt, um, which affected them their whole lives, and partially why they didn't even tell these stories for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and others were simply uh, just traumatized by their memories and by, by the, the grief and the, the, the horrific experiences that they'd been through. And, and one woman who survived the war ends up killing herself because she right. just can't, she cannot continue. Right. Well, and that's not so, of course, those of you who know Primo Levi's story, right? Survival in Auschwitz, um, right? He commits suicide in 1987. Um, sort of to the same point, and Elie Wiesel is the one who says that Primo Levi died at Auschwitz 40 years later. Um, and I think a very powerful uh, way to think about the, the, the long arc of history um, and how it shapes not only the, uh, the survivor, but then, of course, as you know, in, in your family, the next generation and then the following generation. And it is a thread that pulls through um, every family, right, and, and has a different weight for different people. And I think you certainly evoke that. Um, you also uh, tell uh, about Rania as she comes after the war, her motto, it happened and it passed. So let's talk for a moment about that power of history and memory. Um, how does that attitude shape her new life in Israel? So she is the opposite end of right. the person that can't let go of the trauma traumatic memory or experience that's with them all the time. She in the war is over or not even over in 44. She starts writing down her story. She writes her story. It's published in 1945. It's one of the first full length memoirs about the Holocaust. And, and, and for her, that's, that's the therapy. That's part right. of the catharsis. That's the story happened. She wrote it down. And then she's one of the people that she had to move on. And part of that moving on was really a complete repression of the earlier life mm -hmm. story. And I mean, not complete because I know, you know, it, it, it came up in, in other ways, but certainly with her family, with her own children, I mean, I'm, I still send them information about their mother because she talked so little with them about her experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and she seemed to have had a very happy life, mm -hmm. um, you know, and also part of why I was drawn to her. Um, she, you know, life filled with art and, and she was into fashion and uh, travel and friendship. And she was known for her sense of humor. Um, somehow the, the repression of the, of the story, somehow she, she was someone that it, it was, I, I don't wanna say it worked, but she was able, at least in some ways, um, to an observer, she was able to, to move forward. Yes, and, and I think, uh, again, you never know what, uh, what's going to 
um, happen in that sort of post-war period, but hers really does seem extraordinary. She writes the memoir um, and seems to put that chapter away. Uh, right, and and then sort of move on. Now, the research for the project, you have a whole section where you talk about research and and certainly you you cover so much ground and have so many rich stories. Um, and obviously you start at the British Library, but talk a little bit about um, the other places that you went and certainly the Ghetto Fighters um, right, uh, museum and, and sort of research facility is certainly important, but where else uh, did you find yourself? Well, I, I did research. I mean, I did research in archives and libraries because mm -hmm. I was looking for memoirs. I was looking for testimonies. Right. I was looking for anything on the Jewish resistance in Poland, which there is not that much right. writing at all. So, you know, I, I, I went to obviously museums and archives and libraries in Israel, in Poland and across North America. Um, but I also did research with families, I met with about 20 different families um, and asked them these questions about mm -hmm. their mother and their grandmother and, and what they were like. Um, I didn't ask them about the war, I asked them about right. after the war and who yeah. they were and, and what they were, how they filled their days. Um, and then some of my favorite research was kind of what I, I call the, I don't know, experiential wandering in Poland. Mm -hmm. And I just spent time in Poland, sort of going to the places that I, I read about. I, I went there after reading a lot of mm -hmm. these memoirs and testimonies. I had a strong sense of the stories in my head. And, you know, it was very important for me to get on a train between Warsaw and Krakow and to see what that landscape looked like. What did these women see when they were going back and mm -hmm. forth on these trains? How long was it? Tra Obviously trains now are faster, but, you know, I, I, I really tried to envision what it myself tr could I pretend to be not Jewish for this whole train ride and what did they what were they seeing out the window um I a lot of the story takes place in this town called Bejin mm -hmm. and I read a lot about Bejin and I you know we said but what no one ever wrote about was that the town was on a hill and so <laughs> only no one mentioned that in their writing, I guess, in, in the memoirs of the Holocaust. It didn't come up as an important thing. But when I went there, I was like, oh, this whole town is on a slope. Um, so that shifted how I wrote about it and how I sure. experienced it and conveyed it. So that, that was, in some ways, some of my more interesting and well, fun research. It's a wonderful part of the book, where you, the epilogue, where you talk about the travel and, and being there and kind of. Um, the footsteps of history, right? And the echoes uh, that I think are left. So for those of you who haven't read it yet, you'll really, when you get to that point, you sort of become Judy's traveling companion. That's how it felt. You had it in a very personal uh, way, much like a travel log, but in a, but a very emotional, um, I think one. Um, now we're, we've got just another moment or two and I see a couple questions. So don't be shy and pose your questions. But I do want to ask about the title of the book. As someone who's written a lot of books, it's always, there's always a great story about the title of the book. How did it come about for you? Yeah, so this book had many titles um, and nothing was being accepted by the publisher. Of course. <laughs> um, and... I sat with my editor and my agent too. And another, per I mean, we were like, nothing was working. And um, we decided to look at poetry from the ah. time or around the time. And then I remembered that that original Yiddish book that I found all those years ago in the British library had some poems in it. Yes. And it had some song lyrics in it. And I went back and looked at those and I, I translated them to English and I sent them around. And one of them was, written by a, a young Jewish girl. I was part of a ghetto song competition. It was about the Warsaw ghetto and the uprising. And um, she, she was killed, but the song, the song lived on and was published in this book. And mm. the song was about how Warsaw was now decimated, but she wasn't worried because she knew that one day it would, once again, it would see the light of day. And that felt um, felt hopeful, yeah, and inspirational, and and appropriate um, 
And, and then there's a second reason, because mm-hmm. nothing's simple. And in many of the um, uh, accounts and memoirs that I read, the, um, these women were, they really were, they were very hungry. They were very thirsty, which was actually very difficult to read about. I, I found that very troubling. Um, they, they really were thirsty. But the other thing, they were in the underground. And for many of them, they spoke spent a lot of time underground and they wrote a lot about craving the light of day and I don't know somehow that really moved me and just stayed with me as well so I don't know because of this this Mm. double meaning I think I it it worked and then the publisher was happy too. So. Well, it's a beautiful title. And I think you're absolutely right. It, it evokes uh, both of those so powerfully. So I want to look at the chat for a moment, but also to remind you, if you notice that Eagle Eye Books and Decatur um, is the sponsor uh, for the event and they have copies in stock, but they also have signed book plates uh, for your copy. So please uh, support them. We love independent bookstores and they're very important um, in our community. Uh, but Barbara Lang asked the question, I think we sort of touched on it about how many women survived and what became of the survivors. Um, can you talk for just a moment? I know they spread far and wide uh, for those who survived and came to the U.S. and Israel and, you know, certainly went other places. But uh, but what did become of most of the women? I mean, I the, the women who I followed, um, it, it, interestingly, many of them went into caring careers. Interesting. They, nurses. Um, helping in, in uh, refugee aid, social work, um, therapists, um, daycare workers, like ch- working mm-hmm. with children, and some humanitarians too. And I, I actually thought that was very interesting and, and very moving as well. And I, I felt like for many of them, a part of surviving was giving. In mm-hmm. fact, as soon as a war was over, th- that was liberation, many of them talk about as the worst day of their lives because the, this, it, it suddenly set in that their whole world didn't exist anymore. The Over, grief, right? the, the fear and the energy they put into their fight had kept them distracted from the tremendous grief and, and trauma that suddenly when the war was over, they, they were facing you know, it, it you know, in, with such immediacy and, and difficulty, but many of them immediately, immediately, like within days became, they started running um, orphanages. They started finding Jewish children. They started creating safe houses for Jews. This is still in Poland. They, they were trying to help whatever, whoever, whatever survivors they could. And some of them went and, and set up communities in the seventies and the eighties to help survivors. So they, what I'm trying to say is I feel like many of them really, were compa- they, their compassion and their empathy and their, they, their giving helped them move on and help them survive. Mm. And, and that's something I, I try to think about. And, and I, I feel very inspired by that too. Absolutely. Well, and we also have a question from Kay asking, what were some of the youngest known resistance fighters? Um, I mean, I, I'm talking about in my book, I talk about certain um, organizations and, and in those organizations, I mean, there were, you know, I talk about one woman who was I mean, 14, 15, who were involved in this organized resistance work. Um, and we also have, how has this changed you researching and writing this book? I mean, I think it's, you know, when I I began it, I was focused very much on this idea of how trauma transmits over generations. Mm -hmm. But now I'm thinking a lot about how strength transmits over generations Ah. and how, you know, I feel so proud to be part of this legacy. It's, it's shifted my understanding of my, my ancestors, my heritage. Um, Wow. I come from these incredible people. And I think that that's given me strength and, 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 and pride too. Yeah. 
Well, and you talk in the epilogue as you're doing the, the tour through Poland, right? You write, I understood why the Poles felt misunderstood. To be held responsible for the Holocaust seemed unfair, especially when the Polish government did not collaborate with the Nazis. And certainly um, this claim is unjust to those who risked their lives to help the Jews, right? Then again, there are many Poles who did nothing or worse. I've tried to understand the Polish sentiment of victimhood without whitewashing their anti-Semitism, without playing the game of who suffered more. But of course, in the post-war period, as, as Poland ends up in the Soviet bloc and the complex, that kind of complex history. Um, and you also talk about, and I've experienced this very thing, that when you go to Warsaw or other major Polish cities, they have what they call Jewish restaurants, which is sort of baffling because you're sort of thinking, what would a Christian restaurant look like? Right? It's sort of an unusual phenomenon, but they have this sort of performance of Judaism uh, in these restaurants that are sort of a mishmash of food and decor and, and kind of ceremony. It's, it's really quite odd. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? You know, I wrote a piece about this uh, many years ago, and I fascinating. It was something about how I went to Poland to find my missing roots, but I felt that Poland was looking for me. It's missing Jew. Oh yes, and you know, I, I'm, you know, I I went out for lunch. My book is coming out in Poland next year, and I went out for lunch with my Polish publisher. This was obviously before COVID in Krakow, and. They are all like in their thirties, very hip, much yeah. more hip than me. And you know, there are. They, I mentioned that all four of my grandparents were from Poland, from different immigrants. And they thought they're like, all four of your grandparents were from Poland. I said, uh, yeah, of course. And they're like, you're more Polish than any of us. <laughs> um, and that stuck mm -hmm. with me because, you know, I, I, it is such a complicated relationship to this place that I, on the one hand, feel totally alienated from and my whole family ran away from there mm -hmm. um and on the other hand I actually quite like it and I feel you know I fit in and I kind of look like the people and it feels natural to me and in another strange way I, I and so many Poles who I met and talked to were so interested in my work and in my story and in mm -hmm. and in me and and in you know, I really felt from, from them a sense that they, they were missing this Jewish part of their history as well. So indeed, that's another Zoom for another two hours. Absolutely. Session. Well, and I'm looking at Judy Lefkowitz, Judy uh, telling her story about um, being a child of survivors, growing up in Slovakia and growing up in Montreal. And I think you echo exactly what Judy was saying uh, that, uh, that fear is sort of in the DNA of the children of Holocaust survivors. Again, that, that trauma uh, sort of passes through. And so you have a history that you haven't lived, uh, right? But yet is still quite important uh, to your experience. So Judy, thank you for sharing that. Uh, that's certainly with us. Um, so I know as we sort of come uh, to the end, we have just a few moments. Um, I do want to uh, ask a question. I know you talk about this a little bit about uh, how the women's marches of 2017, of course, the Me Too movement and the and the and really the the sort of focus on women and gender and equality and and fairness. Um, influenced your interest in publishing on women's resistance. I, I think that, that the historical moment uh, that you write in always shapes what you choose. Right. Um, so originally I found this source material in 2007, as we said, but I didn't start writing this book until 2017. So for 10 years, I worked on it in drips and drabs. Yeah. I, it went through very many versions. It was going to be a re it was going to be a translation. It was going to be an academic resource. It was going to be an academic book. It was going to be an annotated. It was, then I started writing a novel. I, I didn't quite know what to do with the material right. that I had found. But in 2017, 10 years later, right. suddenly, I, it really, I was like, wait a minute look at these women's marches. There's such mm -hmm. a, suddenly a cultural interest in organized female resistance. Right. And wait a minute, I have an incredible story about organized female resistance. 
maybe, maybe now is the time to tell it. Um, and, and, and it was, I, I, that's when I mentioned it to my agent and then she, I mean, she was like, you have to write this book right now, nonfiction, tell the truth. You owe, tell us this truth. This story is so incredible. Don't, you don't need to write it as fiction. Tell us what happened. Um, so yes, it, it definitely was. I always say some of the reason, you know, zeitgeist is very important. We've thought about different elements of the Holocaust at different times. And, and this is a time where I think we're interested and open to these kinds of stories. Absolutely. And certainly as someone who teaches on the Holocaust and spends a great deal of time thinking about it, both through the Museum of History and Holocaust Education at Kennesaw State, where, where I am, um, you know, I, I just, the generosity, I think, uh, in the book, uh, to scholars and historians and people interested in this period. It really is, a, it's, it's a very generous book, Judy, uh, and a book that is incredibly significant. It's been sitting on my desk for two weeks and everyone who's walked in my office has picked it up and is asked about it and is interested and have been Googling you and listening to the interviews. And, you know, so it was really um, powerful. And I think you, you're right, you've hit this just perfect moment because so much of Holocaust history um, is focused on men, um, right? I mean, there's, there's some on women and there's certainly been more in the last 20 years. Um, and there's certainly in the last 20 to 30 years, the historiography on resistance uh, has certainly transformed uh, itself. But I, I think this contributes to the historiography in a very powerful and profound way. Um, and the way you wrote it in four parts and, and both weave your story um, in as a scholar and as a as a historian uh, into it, it really makes it resonate. So you feel like you come to know the women, but we also feel like we come to know you uh, through it. So again, there's a real generosity in that. Um, so with that, I want to thank um, our organizers, of course, who did a beautiful job. And Judy, I know that you've done a number of these, but our Atlanta audience is very grateful uh, for your time and and your uh, just just your willingness to share the story. Um, I think it resonates uh, with all of us, and we're just so grateful for your work and look forward to what's next. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Of course, of course. And then I'll hand it back to you, Denise. Thank you so much, Dr. Catherine. And thank you all for being with us tonight. We hope you'll join us next Thursday night when we host Dr. Maxie Robinson, who will talk about some of the surprising consequences of um, COVID for us in terms of, mm -hmm. of depression and isolation and those of us who are teleworking and really miss all of those relationships that we haven't been able to, to keep active. So join us again next week. But meanwhile, we thank you all, Dr. Catherine, Miss Judy. It was an absolute delight. And all of us really enjoyed this and loved reading the book. Have a nice evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Enjoy.